So there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Sorry for the delay. I had a few technical issues with the Mac. Apple is always problematic with those kind of things. So <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for making the mistake of choosing this talk instead of the others and staying in this room. I hope you like it and I hope you enjoy it. And thanks to the Bill Logic people for inviting me to be here. I'm super excited. My name is Lucas. Um, I was born and raised in, in Argentina, like Messi, and I play football, not like Messi, <laughs> actually I'm, I'm pretty bad. And I moved to Barcelona six months ago, I think, and since then I gained like four or five kilograms, thanks to Baesha, Tapas, Fidewa, and those kind of things. Uh, I'm CTO at Headway, which is an Argentinian digital advertising company uh, based in Argentina. Our headquarters is back in Buenos Aires, and here we have our second biggest office. And a year ago, we acquired another great digital advertising company, but based in, in, in Barcelona called Smadex. So that's why I'm here. That was my excuse to, to move to, to Barcelona. So we are working together. Again, both companies are inside the digital advertising industry. We are going to see a little bit about that in a few minutes. So this talk is Size Does Matter, and how to build a serverless parallel scale database. Okay, sounds fancy. It is not that fancy. We are going to discover the truth in a few minutes. Uh, so this is going to be our agenda. Uh, the, the main idea of this talk is to share with you some experiences we have uh, during the last uh, five to six years in our company, trying to solve one of our biggest problems. Okay, so what I want to do is to share with you uh, the lessons we learned and the mistakes we made so you can uh, avoid making the same mistakes again. So to do that, I, I need to start with a little bit of context, telling you about Headway, about what we do, how the digital industry works, the digital advertising industry works, uh, not, not, not too technical, okay? So it's going to be boring, but just a few minutes, I need to do it. Then we are going to jump into the problem. So. In order to understand the problem that we want to solve, it's, uh, we need to understand the business. You know, just a few concepts. It's not rocket science. It's super simple, and it's going to take a few minutes. Then we will cover the different attempts we tried again during the last five to six years, different uh, uh, technologies that we implemented trying to solve this problem uh, until now. And at the end, if you are still in this room and you are still awake, uh, we will have a few minutes for Q and A. And the good news is that I bring some chocolates and sweets from Argentina. So if you have uh, good questions, there will be one chocolate for you. <laughs> and if you have easy questions that makes me feel smart and, and better, there will be two chocolates, okay? So stay alert. So let's start with the context again. Uh, I'm sorry, but I need to do this. Little disclaimer, I don't w I, I'm not here to sell what we do, you know? I don't want to <laughs> pitch anything nor getting new leads. The only thing that I'm going to say about Headway, the only biased thing that I'm going to say about Headway and Smadex is that both companies are two of the best companies in the world to work. So if you are looking for a challenge, we are all the time looking for talented people. So come closer uh, to me after the talk or send me an email and maybe we can, we can work together. If you join the company, five chocolates. Okay? So we are rewarding the people all the time. Uh, so a little bit of context, why is Headway? If you look at our, uh, at our tagline, it says digital and app growth marketing company. Wow, nice, super fancy, but what the hell does it mean, okay? In a more detailed way, we can say that we help our clients to grow through digital advertising, okay? This is our goal. But what does it mean? Again, let's, let's put it simpler. So one of our biggest business units right now is app promotion, mobile app promotion. So we help um, mobile app developers to grow, to make their uh, apps successful, okay? So let's suppose we have a client who is the owner of the latest food delivery application that is called DeliverU. So how can we do to help that client to grow through mobile application? What can we do? There are two things that we can do. The first one is help them to get new users, okay? We are always running digital advertising campaigns, okay? We are showing ads. Uh, so the first thing we can do is help them to get new users. That's what we call user acquisition, 
okay? And on the other hand, we can help them to get new orders from existing users, okay? That's what we call uh, user re-engagement or user engagement campaigns, because we try to keep the existing users engaged with the app. We try to keep them using the application, okay? So this is what we do. So how we do it is a different way. It's an ad, there is an ad, uh, there is a life cycle of every app. We all live with this. Every time we read the newspaper, we see uh, advertisements. If you are using ad blockers, please stop doing that because I'm going to lose my job. Uh, so we, we live with this uh, on a daily basis, but on the background, there is a life, uh, a life cycle. Okay, so what happens every time you see an advertisement? The first step to, to help our clients is to show the app. Okay, that's what we call the impression. It's the first step of this chain. Then the user will click on the app if we are lucky, and at the end, there will be what we call a conversion, which is the action that we want the user to do. So if we are promoting, uh, if we are running a user acquisition campaign and we want new users for the Deliver You application, there will be an app that says, hey, download this uh, fantastic app. Then the, the user click on the app and at the end the user will install the app. Okay, that's what we call a uh, conversion. The install of the app, the action of installing the app. Uh, if we are promoting a user re-engagement, probably the conversion will be the, the, the action of placing a new order, okay? So, this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and there are two or three things pretty important that I want you to remember during the talk, because we are going to talk all the time about the same. The first one is that there is a relationship between these three events, okay? because one is the consequence of the other, okay? So the impression leads to a click, the click leads to a conversion, and so on. So we have a, we have a relationship uh, of belonging, if you want, okay? A conversion belongs to a click, and a click belongs to an impression. And we are doing that relationship uh, through different identifiers, okay? That's uh, something important. And the other thing is that there is some time between events, okay? So usually between the impression and the click, there are a few seconds, less than one minute. And in between the click and the conversion, there are a few seconds, or maybe it could be a minute, maybe it could be three days, one week, one month, whatever. Why? Because the user see the advertisement, click on it, and do nothing. Let's suppose that we are trying to convince the user to install the application. The user is going to click on the app, then we are going to send the user to the after, but once uh, the user is there, there is no download. But two weeks after, the user downloads the application. Okay, so that's a conversion for us. But it's a late conversion. It came two weeks later than the click. Okay, this is something important. So this time could be infinite, potentially infinite. Uh, and this is what we call attribution window. Okay, and this is the key concept of the talk. So I have another slide to explain what the attribution window is. So basically, it's a time period during which we can claim conversions, okay? So for example, if we have an attribution window of 24 hours and there is a click right now, we will wait for 24 hours until the conversion occurs. If the conversion takes place in next week, we are going to lose that conversion because it's not inside the, the attribution window, okay? That's why the, the talk is called Science Does Matter because the bigger the attribution window is, the better for the business because we would like to wait forever until there is a conversion, okay? Under the hood, this looks like this, okay? This is the, we are going to the technical part. Uh, so our platform looks like this. Of course, this is a simple diagram. It's a little bit more complex, but for, for the purpose of the talk, is, it's enough. So we are all the time tracking all those kind of events, okay? Every time there is an impression, there is a click, there is a conversion around the world, we get notified that something happened. And we do that with some kind of HTTP listeners. So every time there is a request uh, to our API, it means that there was an impression or a click or a conversion at some, some place. Okay, so everything starts with a click. We have an application, which is a fleet of EC2 instances uh, listening on HTTP port, uh, handling requests that uh, let us know that there was clicks, there were clicks, sorry. So we have incoming clicks on, on one side. Every time we receive a new click, we are going to store that click in a database, okay? So far we are not going to detail anything about the database, but we are going to talk about it in a few minutes, okay? 
but we have thousands of clicks. Uh, actually, I think that we have 10k clicks per second, so we are handling 10k trans HTTP transactions per second, and we are storing all those clicks into into a database. And sometime later, there will be a conversion, so we have a, an HTTP request that uh, will let us know that there was a conversion. And we have to go to that database and look for the click that originated that conversion. Okay. So when we receive this HTTP request, one of the parameters that we are going to receive in the query stream is the click ID. You remember that the conversion belongs to a click, so every time we get a notification about a new conversion, we will receive the click ID, and with that click ID, we need to go to this database, do some kind of key value lookup until we find the click, retrieve that click, and then we can process the conversion. Okay? So, this is how the click ID looks like. This is super important. It's a 32-digit uh, string. The first 10 digits represents the date up to the minute of the click occurrence. Okay? So just having the click ID, we can tell when the click happened, okay? because we have the date in there. And how a click looks like, this is a click. Basically, it's a JSON object with a lot of data. We have two different kind of data inside the click, one related to the user, info, uh, data about the user, geolocation, browser, operating system, those kind of things, and internal data, campaign ID, client ID, uh, data that we need to process the, the conversions. A click uh, size is one kilobyte, we are compressing, and if we compress with GCP, it's going to be like 600 bytes, okay? This is the taxonomy of, of a click. So, as I said, we would like to have the biggest possible attribution window, but extending our attribution window means having a longer click retention period equals a bigger database, because we need to have all those clicks available at the moment of the conversion. So if we want to have an attribution window of one year, sounds good, it's great, but we need to keep in that database one year of clicks available, because when the conversion comes, we need to find that click in order to process the conversion. That's the challenge, okay? So, the problem is what I said. We have this infrastructure, we need that data is to be huge because we are handling 500 million uh, clicks per day, okay? Let's suppose that we want to have an attribution window of 30 days, which is pretty enough, it's acceptable. If we multiply 500 million clicks by the average size of the click compressed by 30 days, which is the attribution window that we want, we have nine to 10 terabytes, okay? So we need a database that will have 10 terabytes of data, 10 terabytes of clicks, and we need to access that database almost in real time with the lowest possible latency in a key value fashion because we have the click ID and we, go, we need to go to that database with the click ID and find the click, and we need, to, uh, we need to have nine to 10 terabytes available, okay? So the problem is how can we do this without spending a lot of money, yes? So this database should be huge, and we want it to be as big as possible, as cheap as possible, and as fast as possible, okay? Impossible. <laughs> we want everything, uh, there is no way to do that. So we have those kind of situations in which you have a triangle, you know, and if I pull from this side, I'm going to affect the other two. So we have to find the balance uh, on this situation, okay? So, now we are going to deep dive into the tech part, which is the most interesting part, I mean, for you, or at least that's what I think you are looking for. And uh, we are going to start five to six years ago with our first try to, to with our first attempt to, to solve this problem. But before we went ahead, I would like to ask you what kind of database would you use in this kind of workload? Okay, we have to store 10 terabytes of data access the data in a key value way, and we want it to be fast. What would you say? Big table. Big table. Okay. Chocolate for you. <laughs> Anyone else? More big table is an answer, not the first. Huh? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Monga. Monga. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Anyone else want the chocolate without, without doing anything? <laughs> okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How much, uh, what is the top clicks 
per minute. You say 500 million per day. Uh, we have between 5k per second and 10k per second, so do That's the math. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, chocolate. <laughs> okay, so before I tell you what we did, uh, let me uh, do two disclaimers. I'm not proud about this. Okay, this was five years ago. We were quite ignorant, quite unconscious of what we were doing. So, do not try this at home, nor at work. Okay, this is not a good idea. Okay, so we used yes, my Uh I know that you probably we have a lot of my SQL lovers here in this conference. I am a MySQL lover too. Actually, we are using MySQL for a lot of different workloads, but this is not a good idea in these kind of situations. Okay, it's difficult to scale, it's costly, it's not a good idea. So after two or three months of having MySQL in production, we we understood that there was a mistake, so we needed to change it. Uh, so we went with another great idea. Okay, so this is the second attempt. It was like four years ago, probably. And uh, this is not the best solution. This is another idea, which is not that bad idea. Okay? This means that it's not a good idea either, but it's not that bad as MySQL. Okay? So we said, okay, let's remove MySQL and put Mongo instead of MySQL. So we set up a three member replica set in the middle of the two applications. So we were putting all those clicks, five to 10K clicks per second writing on Mongo and reading from the other side. This was better than my SQL. At that moment, it was useful. We solved the problem. So we have some cons, some pros and some cons. The pros is that Mongo is easy, more easily scalable because we could add members to the replica set and it's, it's scale. I don't know if it's fast. It's faster than my SQL for, for this purpose, okay? But I wouldn't say that it's fast because it's, it's too much. So we have something more scalable, uh, faster, but uh, we still have the same problem because we have a fixed size. We depend on the volume. We are running on top of AWS. All, all our infrastructure is on top of AWS. So we depend on the size of the GP2 volumes that we were using for, for this replica set. Uh, in a moment, we reach the maximum, which is 12 terabytes per volume. Uh, so we need to start using arrays of volumes. It, it wasn't. It was a uh, really, uh, really big problem, and it's costly. If we do the math, we have 10 terabytes of data per month because we still have the 30 days attribution window. If we multiply that by three re Mongo uh, replicas by one month of retention, and we multiply that by the pricing cost, the public pricing cost of AWS, of volumes, EC2 instances, snapshots, data transfer, and all those kind of things, 7K per month. Yes, you already have a chocolate. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Done. I was going to say compression in one between. It is enabled by default. Now. Yeah. So, so that shows the cut uh, the by 5S, probably. Uh, the, the thing is that our data was already compressed. Okay, so okay. we compressed before we send okay. it to, right. to Mongo. Excellent. So yes, uh, we use, uh, I, th I think it's a snappy or, or, or no, I don't remember the, the compression algorithm, but uh, the difference was not that big, okay? <laughs> no, uh, so actually, these are not chocolates. I, I have real chocolates here, but these are for good, really good questions. Uh, so the cost was like 7K per month. Uh, very, very expensive for us, so we need to change. We said, okay, okay, we need to change. And after having this in production for one year, one year and a half, we started having problems again with the scalability, with the storage size, and with those kind of things. So, uh, chapter four, we need something different, but this time we want to do it well, okay? We want to change technologies but we want it to last at least for a few years. We don't want to change every year because that's what we were doing. So we, start, we started by identifying what we wanted, okay? What we need from a uh, database. So we want it to be uh, key value accessible. Uh, we don't need all the overhead about uh, transactional and relational and security, those kind of things that MySQL offers. We don't need that. We just need a key value database. We want it to be cheap. Okay, as cheap as possible, uh, even for free, if it was possible. 
uh, we want it to be terabyte scalable, okay? Because we uh, have 10 terabytes of data for 30 days attribution window. But as I said, we would like to have a longer attribution window. So if we have a six months attribution window, we will need to start 60 terabytes of data and so on, okay? So we want to scale and the business is growing. So probably this year we have 10 terabytes and next year we have 12 terabytes and so on. So we want to scale easily and we want it to be fast, okay? These were our requirements, uh, pretty demandant on our side. So, alternatives. Uh, Redis and Memcache, Dynamo and Cassandra, okay? What's the problem with these technologies? The first two works in memory. So it was expensive to store 10 terabytes on disk, imagine in memory, okay? Discard it, there is no, it's not an option. And then we have Dynamo and Cassandra, and the problem with these uh, technologies was that they were uh, costly, we do the math, and it was going to cost the same than Mongo, and the other problem that we had is that we have no experience working with Dynamo and Cassandra. So if we chose those technologies, we were buying a problem, you know, because we didn't know how to scale, how to configure, how to maintain, how to monitor anything about those technologies. So we started thinking that we were looking for a unicorn. We wanted a database that solved all our problems, that was fast, cheap, big, beautiful, everything. It doesn't exist, okay? So we need to change the, the way we were thinking, so we started to think uh, in a different way, okay? So, I know that I've been saying all the time that we want a bigger attribution window because it's better for the business, but at this moment, we started thinking about putting aside the technology. We said, okay, let's, let's stop trying to replace the technology. Let's try to think another way to solve this problem. Okay? And the first idea was, okay, let's shrink the attribution window to 24 hours. This is quite the opposite that I've been saying all this time. Okay? This is not a good idea for the business. What happened if we reduced our attribution window from 30 days to 24 hours? We are going to start losing conversions. Okay? Because all those, those conversions that come after those 24 hours, we are not going to be able to process them because we are not going to have the clicks on our database because we reduce the click uh, retention period. So this is not a good idea, but we wanted to try and we wanted to know how many conversions we were going to lose if we do that, if we, if we do this, okay? So the answer is 10%. That means that 90% of the conversion comes within the first 24 hours after the click happened, okay? So we went even more aggressive and we said, okay, what happened if we reduce it to one hour? No 30, day, no 30 days, no 24 hours, just one hour of, of clicks or attention. What is going to happen? How many conversions are we going to lose? So the answer is 30, okay? So that means that 70% of conversions happen within the first hour after the click, okay? So this was pretty interesting and helped us to uh, start thinking in a different way. So uh, we applied this old and well-known methodology, which is divide and conquer. So we said, okay, let's divide the clicks in two different categories, okay? In one hand, we have what we call hot clicks. A hot click is a click that happened during the last hour, okay? So a hot click is frequently accessed because we have 70% of conversions pointing to those kind of clicks. And we have a small number because we have only one hour of clicks, okay? And on the other hand, we have what we call cold clicks, okay? A cold click is a click that happened more than one hour ago, okay? So this is infrequently accessed because we only have 30% of conversions pointing to this kind of clicks, but we have a huge amount of, of, of clicks. So we said, okay, since we have two different kinds of clicks, let's save or store those clicks into different places. So we put on this side Redis for hot clicks and for cold clicks we created a S3 bucket called Fridge. We love to put funny names on things. So we call Fridge because it was going to store the cold clicks. Uh, because Redis is perfect for storing a small amount of data because it fits in memory without a problem. We have 70% of the conversion pointing to those uh, clicks, so it's going to be faster 70% of the times. 
And on the other side, we have Fridge because an S3 bucket because it's super cheap to store a lot of data. Okay, so we also could increase the, the attribution window to six months because storing six months of clicks on S3 is not that expensive. Okay, at least not uh, as expensive as in Mongo or MySQL or whatever. Okay, so we need to change our applications. Sorry, because now we have two different data layers in the middle. There is no one unique data layer. We need to change the code on those applications to be aware of this. Okay, so we are going to analyze what happened when we are handling hot clicks and what happened when we are handling cold clicks and how we do it. So let's go first with the hot clicks. Sorry. Um, because it's the easiest part of the, of the architecture. So we still have those two applications. We still have incoming clicks and we still have incoming conversions, okay? So a click that is happening right now, by definition, is a hot click, okay? So we are going to store all those clicks directly, one by one, into the Redis database. One hour of clicks represents nine gigs of RAM, which is great because we don't need a, a huge instance. We, could manage, we can manage this with, with a, a small instance in, in EC2. So we call that ADES, so we were receiving all the clicks all the time, 10k per second. We were storing those clicks directly one by one in Redis, in CSV format. We chose CSV because it's lighter than JSON, but we could use some binary format, which was going to be better, but it's up to you. So we were storing all those clicks, and when we receive a conversion on this side, remember that in the HTTP request, we are going to receive the click ID as a parameter. In the first 10 digits of the click ID, we have the click date. So we can, know, we can know without doing any query if the click is a hot click or a cold click, okay? So if the date is within the last hour, this application is sure that the click is going to be available on Redis. So it's going to query Redis in a key value way. So we are going to retrieve the click, we are going to convert it, everything in just a few milliseconds, okay? So this is a happy path. And this happens 70% of the time, because 70% of the conversions belongs to hot clicks, okay? What happened with cold clicks? And it's a little bit uh, more tricky, so we are going to split it in two parts. How we store cold clicks and how we read those cold clicks, okay? So, we still have incoming clicks on our EC2 uh, fleet. Those clicks were going to Redis, we already saw that. And besides that, we have FluentD, which is a log manager daemon inside uh, our EC2 instances. And that daemon is buffering those clicks, okay? So we are buffering clicks until we reach one minute. So every time we have a file with one minute of clicks, we are going to flush that file to the fridge, okay? FluentD is, is going to do that. So we are still receiving clicks, we are saving those clicks to Redis, and we are buffering inside each of those EC2 instances. Once we have one minute of clicks in a file, we are going to flush that file to S3, okay? So at the end, we will have a lot of JSON files on S3, one per minute per instance, and we have a Lambda function that we call Alfredo that will take those files and we'll transform those files from JSON to Parquet, okay? So at the end of the, of the day, in this bucket, we will have a lot of different files in Parquet format, one per, once per minute per instance, okay? And what we did was organizing those files in one directory per minute. So in the fridge, we have one directory per minute, and inside every directory, we have one file per instance containing all the clicks that that instance handle in that specific uh, minute, okay? So this is how we store clicks. Of course, we are going to have at least one minute of delay on the, on the fridge, okay? Because data is going to take one minute to be there because we are buffering inside the, the instances. Uh, this is an auto scale group, so instances are disappearing all the time. Of course, we, have a, we, we handle that, so every time there is a shoot down, we are going to flush the, the, the buffer before the instance goes down. So this is how we produce clicks. Let's see how we read clicks, and this is even more complex, okay? So we move to the other side, to the conversion tracking application. So we receive a, a notification about a conversion. This means that in some place in the world, there was an install, and it belongs to us. So we receive the HTTP request with a click ID 
the application knows that that click is not a hot click, it's a cold click. Okay? So we have a problem because it's not in, in Redis. What are we going to do? Go into S3 to find the click is not possible because it's going to be too slow and too complex. So we are going to do it in an asynchronous way. Okay? So basically this application is going to ask another application through a message to retrieve the, that click from the fridge and put it back to Redis. Okay? We said that we are warming up those clicks because we are transforming cold clicks into hot clicks. We are moving the clicks from one data layer to the other. So the application knows that the, this specific click is not present in, in Redis, so it's going to send a message to an SQS queue, and that SQS queue will be consumed by another Lambda function that we call Caronte, and that Lambda will buffer a few messages, will retrieve a few messages from, from the queue, and will prepare an SQL query that will be run on top of the fridge using AWS Athena. Athena is a managed Presto service that AWS offers, okay? So we can run SQL queries on top of a structured data on, on, on S3, and we have a structured data because we have all our clicks in one folder per minute in parquet format, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit on, on this part because it's, it's the most interesting part about the, the infrastructure. So we have the fridge, which is a huge bucket, we have one directory per minute. Inside those directory, we have one file per instance containing clicks in parquet format. So we, are, we have incoming files in JSON format. We have Alfredo there transforming everything to parquet. So this is the, the, the final picture of the bucket. And on this side, we have Athena, which is running Presto under the hood. So when we receive a message that we want to recover a click, this is a call click, okay? So we need this to recover the click from the bucket and put it back to Redis. So we are taking advantage of having the time of the click because we can match this, sorry. We can match this time with a specific folder, okay? So we don't need to scan all the other directories. We do this in this way because Athena is going to charge us uh, by the data we scan in order to uh, answer our queries. So we want to scan just a few bytes. This way, we can match the directory. So we are going to go inside the directory and we are going to scan only that directory and only the columns that we want to scan because it's in parquet format. Since it's columnar, we are not going to scan any column that we don't need, okay? So we are not running these queries uh, click by click. Again, as I told you, this Lambda function it's going to buffer a few messages and we are going to retrieve a few clicks in a, in a single query because another limitation that we have is that Athena limits the, the number of concurrent queries that we can run, okay? So we don't want to do this click by click, we want to group those clicks and, and do big, and run big queries. So we retrieve the click, uh, super efficient, beautiful. And the result is going to be stored in a S3 bucket, another S3 bucket, which is a temporary S3 bucket. This file is, will be a CSV file containing the uh, one click per row, which is a result of the query that we just ran. That file will trigger another Lambda function, and that Lambda will extract all those uh, clicks from the CSV file and will put them back into the hot uh, layer. So we just warmed up the click. Okay, it was on the cold layer, now it's on the, on the hot layer. We transform the click from cold to hot. And that lambda will put a, another message into a different queue that will inform the conversion application that now the click is ready, is, is available on Redis. So let's retry the transaction. Let's do it again. All this life cycle takes between two to five seconds. Okay? So it's a lot of latency, but it's happening only 30% of the times and it's acceptable for us, okay? So 70% of the transaction, we can process them in real time. Only 30%, we have to do it asynchronously, and we are going to use this uh, infrastructure, and it's going to take between five, or between three to five seconds, okay, until we complete all the, all the, the cycle. With this technology, uh, we were able to increase our attribution window to six months, okay? So we multiply by six, the attribution window, and we reduced the cost six times as well, okay? So it was a perfect trade-off because now we have S3 storage cost, we have Elastic Cache for running 
the Redis cluster. We have a few bugs on Athena, a few bugs on Lambdas, and that's uh, sum up one, one K per month, okay? So we increased the attribution window and we reduced the cost almost in the same proportion, which is, was, which, which is what we wanted, okay? So that's it. Hope you like it. If you have any questions, I have plenty of chocolates and, and sweets here. Easy questions, remember. Oh, easy. Okay. No. Yeah, <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> so the question is, uh, when you have this miss, right, the miss, 30%, how this affects the, the, the user? Is there constant asynchronous or is there, is there any weight? No, the user is not going to be affected because the, the transaction is initiated by the application, by, by our client. So the user is already using the application and the user is not conscious that all this thing is happening in the background, behind. right? The, the ap application is requesting it in the background. Yeah, right? yeah. What if the request is killed, right? Like network timeout because it's three seconds, right? Uh, what will but happen? it's not synchronous, remember. Yeah, when, when the application hits our API, we are going to reply 200 instantly. Okay, ah. and we're going to enqueue the shop on our side. Got it. Okay, so the application won't tell that this is happening. For their eyes, it's instant. It's, it's the instantly. Okay, so we don't have any kind of delay. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, backups. Well, backups. Yeah. Backups. Yeah. Uh, yes. Backups. We have backups uh, with S3 uh, because it's automated with uh, with uh, AWS. Uh, we, we have versioning and cross replication. And cross replication. Yeah, exactly. And for Redis, we are not backing it up. Why? Because we only have one hour of clicks on Redis. So if Redis explodes, not, not even we, 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 we say nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. We are not backing up Redis. And the, the reason is, if Redis explodes for some reason, we are going to replace the cluster instantly. We have a disaster recovery scenario in which we remove the cluster and put a new one, which is empty. So for the next hour, we will have all the conversions going to the cold path, okay? Which is okay. Yeah, it's okay. We can, we can manage that. So one hour later, the new ready cluster will be ready. So that's what it takes to... to that's why we are not backing up the, the ready cluster. Actually, you could even reload the previous hour from, from S3 into the... Ready. Yeah, but probably that will take, I don't know, 20 minutes, yeah. so we will only have 40 minutes left until yeah. we have the cluster up and running again, so yeah, it's a complexity that we don't uh, need to handle. Well, so chocolate for you. That's a quick one. Okay, yeah. Nice. And you, you, just, you earn another chocolate. <laughs> but you are too far, I'm not, I'm not going to throw it, because <laughs> I'm not sure if we have some kind of insurance if something happens. <laughs> uh, another, any other question? Yes. Okay, that's a good question, chocolate for you. Uh, we cannot discard the data because we are tracking a lot of events. So once we convert the click, we are still interested in all the activity of that user after the conversion. So let's suppose we are promoting an application and we want to track installs. Okay, so we have the click, there is an install, we convert, perfect. But after the, the conversion, we are, we are going to still receive notification about if the user places orders. Okay, or uh, take a ride if you are talking about a taxi application. So we want to keep track of the user. Okay? You, you want to say that the first click is your uh, identification of the user for yeah. its uh, life, uh, life cycle? It's not the first click, it's the last one. Because if, they cl if the user okay. clicked on the same ad multiple times, we are only, only going to okay. take in consideration the last one. It's yeah. the identification of the customer for the enterprise for the life cycle return. Exactly. Yeah. Because so we are keeping all clicks, all of them, all of them. But when a click but converts... You know, you know, for example, if I am the user and I see the, the advertisement in a few places, but I'm yeah. clicking on them, yeah. but I'm not converting this, can you, can you find uh, C, or you need to keep all the channels and then see this channel was better and it's converted better? Okay, it's a good question. If you, if you are clicking on, a, on the same ad on multiple channels, there are going to be multiple click IDs, okay? So for the system, you are not the same user. Then uh, on the background, we can do some kind of analysis trying to cross the data. 
and using some kind of algorithm to identify your IP, your geolocation, your device ID, your MAC address, a lot, lot of things to try to identify that all those clicks belong to the same user and only one is converted. And then you can compress all this to one user? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other question? And the red is when you, uh, when you file it for one hour, right? When you, you can file it for one day, right? Yeah. What was the difference? Okay, you lost 10%. And, but would you still the price points and what are yeah, it's a good question. We can we can play with the ready size. Mm -hmm. Actually, we are not storing one hour. To be honest, the eviction algorithm of the of the cluster is configured to delete clicks that are older than one hour if there is no memory, if there is no free memory. So probably we are storing more than one hour. One hour is the minimum amount of clicks that we are storing. But yes. If, if you have some kind of, this kind of uh, scenarios, you can start analyzing which is the, better, the best size for your cluster that makes sense. Because yes, if we increase one hour to three, probably we are going to cover 80%. If we increase it to six, 92%, and, and that's it, okay? Yeah, so it's a good question. Any other? Yeah? So I'm curious in this case, uh, is it possible that the conversion will come in which will be very old. And you partition by minute. Yeah. So that means that you will have to, because the, the input, your input is the unique ID, yeah. right? So by date, you can determine that uh, bucket. But what if you will not find this? Uh, does that make sense what I'm saying? Uh, if it's over your window. If it's over our window, we are going to lose it. We can do nothing. No, uh, right now we have six months of retention. Right. If we receive a conversion that is six months and one day older, we can do nothing. We are going to lose it. Uh -huh. So you're not going to another bucket where you store the stuff. No. Data, right? and another question. You said that you are you're using uh, Athena, right? Yeah. Which will charge you additionally. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason for that? You can use the pipe or anything else for SQL layer on top of that? Yeah, we tried. We try to, to set up our own EMR cluster with, with Hive to run this kind of, of, of queries. The thing is, it wasn't uh, as fast as Athena, and we needed to keep the cluster up and, up and running 24 hours a day. This, this way, we only pay for what we use. That's, that's why we chose Athena, and to be completely honest with you, we are, we are pretty lazy, so we, don't, we didn't want to, to maintain the EMR cluster. This was super useful, this was, was what we wanted, so we, we went with uh, Athena. But we have a problem that we will have to handle in a few, in a few months, probably, with the concurrency. Again, Athena is limiting uh, us with the concurrency that we have, so we are going multi-region. We are starting to run the same queries in different regions to increase the, the concurrency. That's the problem we have, but not the cost. I can totally see, because the, you, you have this great idea of storing the date prepared yeah. the, ha the hash the yeah. with the date, you can implement that in the code, in the uh, Lambda code potentially. Yes. You can, you can read, you just need to read one minute uh, uh, but this, uh, one minute directory, that's it. And then you can read, you can use the functions, you can use the libraries to read the parquet files. Yeah, actually, actually there is a, a better approach. Uh -huh. Uh, AWS, uh, we don't have more time, so this is going to be the, the last question. If you want, we can keep talking uh, outside. But there is another service of uh, AWS called S3 Select that allows you to run a SQL query against a specific file. Okay? We can do that right now because with a click ID, we don't know the specific file. We know the specific directory. We know the specific partition. But inside the partition, we will have 20 different files because at that moment there were 20 different instances running. Okay, so if we managed to identify which file contains the click that we are looking for, that would be faster, easier, and cheaper. But we didn't yet. Okay, but this is this this is another approach that we will, we will do. Okay, thank you all.